I want you guys to, uh, we'll, we'll turn to the scripture in a minute, but I want you to just listen. Today we're talking about salt and love. Now I've preached on salt and light before. You read the scripture about salt and light, that you are salt and light. This is different scripture this morning. We're going to be talking about salt and love. Amen? I want you to listen to this. This is Paul writing to the Colossians, the church in Colossae. This is in Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6. It says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Amen? I want you guys to, show, I want you to put up that picture that I put back there, um, other than the title. No, the other one. We're going to start off controversial this morning, shall we? This is a post that I put on Facebook on April 29th of this year, and it is a picture of Jesus at the Sermon of the Mount. He says, Love one another. People are grumbling. What if they're immigrants or gay or poor? To which Jesus replies here, did I stutter? And I shared this when it popped up on my Facebook timeline, and we ended up having a wonderful conversation on our leadership call that night about it, because what ended up happening after I posted this was shocking to me, and it irritated, and it made me angry with righteous indignation. And I'm not one to get in conversations and, and, and arguments on Facebook or social media. I think for the most part that is completely stupid. I don't think hardly anyone's mind has been changed by keyboard commandos on Facebook. You know, it, it, all that usually ends up happening with social media is that everyone just keeps restating their points over and over and over again. We start where we are, we end where we are. But there's some times that I cannot let it slide. There's some times that I have to put my foot down. In the body of Christ, I've often said that there are lots of things that we can agree to disagree on. In fact, that's why there are numerous denominations. Because there are differences in interpretation that as the body of Christ, we have simply agreed to disagree on. But there are certain hills that I will plant my flag and die defending before I will allow something that is incorrect teaching to pass. And so what was surprising when I posted this was the vitriol and the disdain and the arguments that were then posted in response to this by Christians by people that I know profess to be Christian. And the problem that they kept having was they would see this and they would start arguing about the sin that is demonstrated up here. Start arguing about the, the wickedness of homosexuality. I'm not quite sure they could argue with me wickedness on poor immigrants without me smacking them really, really, really hard. So they would argue this about me. And, and the point that I kept illustrating is that's not what it's saying. I'm, you know, I'm sorry. Do I speak in a thick accent that I'm not aware of? Is this hard to read? It Does it say we condone any sin up here? No. What Jesus is saying is love one another. Period. And that's the point. Love one another. I had a, a, a gentleman, one of these guys, I don't even know him. He, you know, you make these friends with people in groups on Facebook and whatnot. And he started arguing with me. And I really wanted to like lay out the I have a degree in this trump card, but I didn't. Um, because this young man is actually going through seminary now. And I'm praying that he learns as he's going through seminary what love means, what the love of God means, and what it means to love one another, period. The end. And if there was any confusion after that, Jesus says, love those who persecute you. Pray for them. Love To love thy enemies. I mean, you cannot get more succinct in the point than when it includes everybody. It includes your enemies. It includes those who would come against you. That's who Jesus is including in this. To love one another. And so with this in mind, I want us to read again in Colossians. Chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. We're going to spend some time in Colossians. I think this book is very relevant to our society today. 
It says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. The biblical meaning of salt has, has a few different connotations. Salt, depending upon its context in scripture, can mean longevity, can point to flavor, purity. It can be symbolic of the covenant relationship with God. This letter, though, was written to the church in Colossae, which was a Gentile church. And the Greeks understood salt as zest and liveliness, much how we would associate it today. Sabor, flavor, savor, salt. Yes, I like salt. Who likes salt? I like salt. Who in here is guilty of getting to the Mexican restaurant and salting the chips? Like without even having one, you just salt the chips. Like it might have salt, but it doesn't have enough salt. We know what salt is, right? And, and so the, the way that we would think about it in, in that context, zest, liveliness, flavorful, uh, is exactly what Paul's saying here. He doesn't mean salty language. That's a whole other modern connotation. We're not getting salty up in here, okay? But what is he saying? Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. He's talking about the lost. Those who are outside of the fold of the body of Christ. Walk in wisdom toward them who are outside redeeming the time. That, that He's saying that there's hope for them. Okay, they're outside their church. They're biding their time, but they have time. Walk in wisdom. Let your speech always be with grace. You know, I I think about this, and I watch newsreels. In fact, as I was preparing the sermon yesterday, it was a, an emotionally trying time for me when I'm I'm preparing a sermon that's that's dealing with scripture that involves such grace and love from God toward us. And you juxtapose that, you compare and contrast that with how a lot of people in our society who are in the church behave toward the lost. And it's, it's pretty heartbreaking. Let your speech always be with grace. While I was preparing this, I, I did some research. I was finding clips on YouTube of uh, Christians I'm going to use air quotes because we will know them by their fruit. I'm not judging them. I'm just saying. So there were Christians who were in picket lines protesting various things. In one case, they were protesting Muslims in Texas. And they were yelling at them with hateful speech. And they were going up there and taking their microphones and doing all of these things because they believed differently than them. And I look at that and think, that's not grace. And that's counterproductive. So let your speech always be in grace. We're supposed to walk in wisdom and grace toward the lost. You think about the people in your life that are outside of the church, those who don't serve God, those who don't believe in God. And you begin to realize pretty quickly that if we are to be a living testimony, that's what the Bible says we are, we are to be the living word of God. Our life is supposed to be a testimony of the Bible that they may never read, that the only way that that will accomplish anything is if we walk in wisdom and grace toward them. If we expect them to live as we do, despite the fact that they don't believe as we do, it's kind of a flawed expectation, right? When people say, well, that person believes in X, Y, Z, I said, yeah, they're not saved. They don't believe in God. So why should we be surprised if they believe differently than we do, if they conduct themselves differently than we do, if they have a morality that's different than, than we do? That actually should be the expectation. And you know what will never happen? We will never change the world by trying to redeem their actions. In fact, Paul argued this continually, that people were not saved by their own righteousness, right? These are things that we read in the Word of God. You can't change society by 
yelling about people's actions because it comes down to their heart. The only way that you can change society is by reaching people's hearts. If we want to change the country and the land that we live in, we have to reach the people that are here. And as we reach the people that are here, and their hearts and lives are changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, then they are redeemed and our society is redeemed. Because society is made up of people. You know, I don't know why this is a shock, but I watch the way people behave, and that's not the way people behave. They don't look at society as people. They look at society as groups. They look at society as, as partitions that you can organize and preach at. And then Paul says, seasoned with salt. I love this. Seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Paul's saying that we shouldn't be boring. Amen? We shouldn't be boring. You ever heard the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't? I hate this saying. This is an idiom. Okay. If you don't know what that is, ask Lucas. He'll explain to you later. <laughs> it's an idiom, and I've come to despise it because it's a comment that conveys frustration and hopelessness. It's an attitude of someone that has made an effort at a task and given up. More specifically, we use this phrase to convey the idea that you can give someone an advantage or provide them with an opportunity, but you can't force them to do something if they don't want to do it, right? And I get that. I understand that. I understand the truth in that. But let's consider the mental picture of this phrase because I think it clearly demonstrates the error of the church today. The picture in my mind is of this rider, okay? But he's not on the horse, is he? He's on his feet, bridle in hand, leading the horse to the watering hole. That's what we call it in Texas for everyone watching online. It's the watering hole. He's leading this horse to the, to the trough to drink. And the horse is eventually, is by connotation, not wanting to. So you have this person dragging or attempting to this horse to get some water because he thinks the, wa the horse needs to drink some water. And you can't do that. You can't, the horse is going to overpower you, right? You can't make it drink. But why wouldn't the horse want to drink? Because it's not thirsty. Isn't that like a duh moment? The horse doesn't want to drink because the horse isn't thirsty. And if the horse is thirsty, guess what? It's going to want to drink. It was a professor of mine at ORU that pointed out the error of the idiom to me. He says, you can't make a horse drink. So he says, so what can you do? It's what you can do. The horse doesn't want to drink because the horse isn't thirsty. But if you give a horse salt, the horse will thirst, and then the horse will desire to drink. The idea is that if we are trying to preach the gospel without compromise, we should never compromise the word of God. We should never say something that's not right is right. But if we are trying to preach the gospel and it is falling upon deaf ears, if we are quote unquote, trying to lead them to drink, giving them every advantage and opportunity and they don't seem to take it, we need to understand that that's because they are not thirsty for it. And when Paul is saying to us that we need to walk in grace and wisdom and have salt on our words so that with every single person we come in contact with, we know what to say, he is saying that our words should be such that they entice people to the gospel of Christ. That we are to entice them because the truth is we can't force them, right? We can't force them. And the church has done a very lame job in the 20th and 21st century of simply saying we've done our task by putting it up there and they didn't want it. Let's just keep trying the same old thing over and over and over again. I don't know why it's not working. And that is the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Our conversation, 
our language should make them thirst for God. As the embodiment of the church, that's what we are. We, this place, I've said this countless times, so I'm going to say it again. This place is not the church. You are the church. You are the church. The people at another building congregating today and worshiping Jesus Christ, they are the church. And the other people that are under a bridge and they're serving, they are the church. And the people that are hiding in another country because it's illegal for them to worship our God, they are the church. We are the embodiment of the church. And it is our burden to be wise in our conduct and relationship with those that are apart from the body of Christ, to use wisdom in how we conduct ourselves, to use salty language in the good way, okay? Language that makes them thirst for God. The context of this scripture in Colossians is interesting because there was rumors going around about the conduct of Christians. And so Paul is warning them. Listen, he's saying, you are turning off people from the gospel of Christ. By your actions and and the whisperings of people, you are turning them away. And so you should be above reproach. We've seen this in Paul's writings before, right? You should be above reproach in your attitude, in your actions, in your activity. And you should approach them with all grace and love and talk to them in a way that they will be enticed to understand what the truth of the gospel of Christ is. That is what Paul is saying to them in Colossae. Guess what? That is what Paul is saying to us in San Antonio today and throughout every, this entire nation. We have set up roadblocks to the gospel, stumbling blocks that even if someone wanted to learn more about the Bible, we have put up roadblocks by our actions and our language and the activity of some Christians that are preventing them from reaching the truth because on the way there, they hit something else. They arrive to some opinion that we do not walk after Jesus Christ. In the video that I watched of the woman attacking these Muslims, it then cuts to this reporter saying, well, that's Jesus-like. That was turning the other cheek. That was walking in love. And this reporter is absolutely right in his sarcasm because none of her behavior was doing those things. Do you see? And so we have to Walk in humility and love and wisdom and grace and understand the task that we have before us. I've I've often preached that I believe that community takes place before communion. When Paul's writing here, he is not instructing on how to do a million-member crusade, right? He's talking about our relationships with individuals. And that's what's really important because this comes down to our relationship with individuals. Your relationship with individuals in your life. That's what he's talking about here. And in those relationships, people become part of a community community before they ever become part of the communion. In other words, in our society today, more so than ever before, we live in a post-Christian society. Most of the world is antagonistic to our faith, increasingly so in our own country. And so if we want to lead somebody to the truth of the gospel, we should know, we should foreknow that what we are talking to is someone who has been indoctrinated with obstacles to the faith. And the only way that we will help to overcome those obstacles is by being there in their lives, speaking to that individual by the power of the word of God, the power of our testimony, through the power of the Holy Spirit within us, in love. Amen? And that's why we're going to move on. It's salt and love. Now, we don't have time to go through all of this. I want to give you an overview of what's happening in Colossians when we get to this point, because before from about Colossians chapter 2 to this beginning part of chapter 4, Paul unloads a ton of theology that is very important to our lives today. In Colossians 2, he's guarding them against vain religion. Do you know what vain religion is? Vain religion is religion for the sake of religion. It's following rules, period. It's not relationship. In fact, he was warning them, a Gentile church of those who might come from Jewish communities and try to instruct them to follow Jewish law, saying, you're not under that. 
You're not under that. Guess what? You're not under that. You want to go eat a BLT? I'm going to eat a BLT with you. I like bacon. Okay? If you don't like bacon, that's fine. Don't eat bacon. But you're not under the law. It's not sinful, right? And so he's instructing them, it, it matters not about ceremonies or the phases of the moon or what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to touch. That's all out the window. This is what you should focus on. And he then talks about specific behavior in our hearts, okay? It says uh, in verse, we're going to read in 3, verse 5 through 17, Colossians 3, 5 through 17, he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of these things, like anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language. Do not lie to one another since you've taken off your old self with its practices. Put on a new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here, there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and is in all. How many other ways can we say it doesn't matter who they are, where they came from? Therefore, as God's chosen people, verse 12, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If you have any, if any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We often talk about this if you have a grievance against your brother. It's anyone. Anyone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. That's verse 4. All these virtues, over all of these virtues, over compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, put love, which binds them all together. I want you to jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 with me. This is the love chapter. We're familiar with this, right? We are called to love above all. Say amen when you're there. Amen. It says, I'm going to read through the whole chapter real quick, so keep up with me. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. It's kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Did y'all catch that? Did y'all catch that? He's echoing what he said in Colossians. That love is above these things because love is the culmination of these things. It is kind. It is patient. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not honor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. If you ever see a Christian behaving in a way that you don't think is appropriate, or you catch yourself behaving in a way that isn't appropriate, I want you to think about these things. Are you being self-seeking, dishonoring others? Are you easily angered? Are you keeping a wrong? Because love doesn't do those things. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now pay attention here. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put away ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face, now in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. For now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Everything is a waste without love. And without love and compassion to reach the lost, there is little need for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I want to say that again because I want this to, to resound in you. Without love and compassion for the lost, 
what point is there to the gifts of the Holy Spirit? See, in the contrast of Paul's writings, he's illustrating something. He's illustrating that love is permanent, while tongues, prophecies, and knowledge are not. Right? He says that. He says they're not permanent. They will pass away. There will come a time when they cease. And the reason that they cease is because they are imperfect and they are partial. That's what Paul's writing. One day, when things are complete, we won't need them. What does he mean? He means complete is when we are glorified with God in heaven. At that time, is there a need for prophecy? It's come to pass, right? We are in heaven, in the glory of God. Tongues, knowledge will be complete. Our heavenly language will be perfected. And so the partial has passed away. This also means that in contrast to these three things, love is permanent because love is already perfected. The perfect love of God is available now, not in part because the perfect love of God has been exemplified in his son, Jesus Christ. It has been poured out upon the earth and covered us through his blood. And the perfect love of God has filled us by his Holy Spirit. Are you getting a hold of this? The gifts that Paul encourages us to long for pale in comparison to the love of God. And I just earnestly hope that this, the, the many of us who yearn to see those gifts flow in our lives yearn greater for the love of God to be poured out in our lives. If you want to see, here's the truth of it, here's the practical application for you. If you want to see the gifts of God move in your life, if you want to see the gifts of prophecy, of healing, of knowledge, guess what? You need to be around people that need those things. Pastor said that before. If you want to see God move in this place, if you want to see revival take place, then the lost need to be here. And you will see God move. Because they will... Check. They will only come because of love. And they will only get here through us. God doesn't want to move without you. He wants to move within you. I contemplated the other day about the name of our church and our vision. We are Expect a Miracle Church. We are. We are the embodiment of this congregation. Just as Paul was writing to the Ephesians and the Colossians, we are Expect a Miracle Church. It means we expect miracles. We have expectation for God moving. And in all of my study of the word of God, do you know what I found? That he wants to move through us. And if he wants to move through us, and we have an expectation for him to move, then we need to have an expectation that we're going to move. Amen? We have to embody the expectation of miracles in the lives of those that we come in contact with. And if we're not seeing it, it comes down to this. We are not walking in wisdom and grace and love and compassion toward them. We have rejected the call that our language should entice them. Maybe we have just become complacent. We have become comfortable. We've become too busy. Whatever the reason is, we have to move past that because it is our burden that we are called to. We are called to walk in expectation that God moves through us. I read through our vision multiple times, and that is the summation of our vision. The vision of this ministry is that we have an expectation of God moving through us in the miraculous. Moving through us in the miraculous. And as much as we may talk about tongues or healing or prophecy, no, they're imperfect and partial compared to the love of God. And so if you want to see God's miraculous move through you, then you have to open yourself to allow the perfect love of God to move through you because there is nothing more miraculous than that. There is nothing more miraculous than that. It was the love of God that allowed God to condescend to our level and to become like us, to suffer greater than we so that we could be forgiven 
And so that we could be reconciled to him. Is the love of God that allows us into that holy of holies. Is the love of God that allows the holy of holies to be embodied within us as we are the temples holding the Holy Spirit that we seek. It is the love of God. And so by this love, see, Paul what he is doing is he is calling us to a practical faith. And a practical faith is founded in love. If your faith is not practical, then your faith is worthless. And so we must abide in love, walk in love to each other, and even greater so to the world, to the lost, to those who are on the outside. So here's the thing. Get practical, right? If they're outside, where do you find them? Outside. They're outside. So we have to go outside. And I'll finish with the scripture from Colossians because I want it to reside in your hearts today. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Amen? Amen.